Hi guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and today I have Dr. Bill Campbell back on the show. We're talking about a couple of studies, really interesting stuff, and we have really fun back and forth about this. One of them is the change in the thermic effect of feeding, depending on your eating schedule, and the other one is how often should you change up your training routine? Does it have an impact? And there was an eight week study that looked into this and some really interesting discussion, I think. And I think you're gonna really enjoy it. Before I get into that, or before we get into that, I just wanted to remind you that the improvement season, which you may have listened to on this podcast before, has now moved. We've migrated it to its own podcast. So now where you're listening is always going to be expert interviews. The improvement season where I chat to my man, Pascal, is gonna be on the improvement season podcast, which you can find on any podcast provider. If you're here on YouTube, which you can also watch me and Bill on YouTube, then you'll find the improvement season on our same YouTube channel. So hopefully that is clear and makes sense to you guys. Any questions, you just hit us up. And as always, if you did enjoy this, like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. But without further ado, let's get into the show. Hi guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall, and today I have Bill Campbell back on the show. And uh, last time we were on episode 321, so it hasn't been uh, too many episodes, but time flies massively and we were talking about diet breaks. And this time around, uh, we're going to be talking about a study that uh, I just read about uh, in his uh, kind of research review, Body by Science, uh, the January edition. So anyone who's already part of that will have heard uh, or read, sorry, uh, kind of Bill's ideas behind this and kind of the study itself, which was really interesting. But I think this will flush out even further. So this was kind of does a regular feeding schedule increase the thermic effect of food? I think a lot of the listeners will know what the thermic effect of food is, kind of a component, I guess, of the metabolism and uh, kind of part of our energy expenditure and uh, this study was by i'm going to pronounce it wrong al hussein et al 2022 and uh, you guys uh, kind of reviewed that and i thought i'd pass it over to you i think you did a really good job first of all kind of constructing i kind of mentioned it offhand like people know what the thermic effect of feeding is part of the metabolism but i thought you guys did a great job of kind of breaking down initially like the background just to give not like you had pages and pages of it but just like the simple background of why this might be something that's interesting yeah, yeah, thank you. It's it was a study. I don't I don't even remember where I came across it. It's a recent publication and it was surprising to me. So the I I'm sure we'll talk about the results, but yeah, this the the, the surprising part of it. And in terms of the background, since since the review is very focused on, well, it's only focused on body composition, I always try to frame things from the energy balance model, which this study fits in perfectly in terms of you have calories in and calories out. And the calories out, or what some people call your total daily energy expenditure, there's there's four main compartments. Your resting energy expenditure, that's like 65% of all the calories you burn in a day. Then there is your exercise energy expenditure. That's pretty small for most people, like 5%, but of course it's highly variable if you're doing a lot of cardio and a lot of resistance training. Then we have your non-exercise energy expenditure. Some people will also refer to that as NEAT. That's also not a big component. And then the last variable is the thermic effect of feeding. Some people call that dietary-induced thermogenesis. So our, our bodies will actually burn calories in the during the process of eating. So you eat three or four times per day. Your body has to work, expend energy, to digest, absorb, transport, and uptake those nutrients into your body. And everybody's focus, including mine, has always been that protein is really thermogenic. If you eat more protein, your body burns more calories. It's hard to break those nitrogen bonds in protein, so it just takes more energy. And this study made me appreciate, well, there's more more than just the macronutrients. There also may be a feeding schedule approach that could potentially increase the amount of calories that you burn in a day. 
Yeah, I think, uh, like I said before, I think, a lot, or I maybe said it to you off air, where a lot of people are like, oh, it's like 10% of like your energy expenditure. And like we have, I guess, as a, like you don't take it to this extreme where you just eat protein and nothing else. It's like there's a certain amount, of, like you need enough carbohydrates to fuel training, recovery. You need a certain amount of fat for kind of the, the essential fatty acids and what that might do for hormones and things. And then you have a protein intake and there's not really any benefits to going far beyond that. Like you're, you're not going to suddenly lose like pounds of fat because you're eating tons of protein and nothing else. So I think a lot of people kind of put it to one side and like, right. So yeah, I mean, it does something, but there's nothing we can really do more to enhance it apart from we've got a high protein diet already. Whereas like you said, this study was kind of surprising because it's showing maybe there is something more we can do here. So uh, yeah, the study, uh, I'll, I'll let you kind of overview it and uh, let the listeners know what happened there. All right. So again, we're just looking at the end of the day. Did it did whatever I'm going to describe, did it cause more calories to be burned? And the 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 implication there is if you're burning more calories, you will lose more body fat. So that's the the context here. And again, that assumes that all else is equal, that you don't change your food intake, you don't change your exercise habits. So what they did in this study, they had one group of people, but they had them do two different eating conditions. So we call this a within subjects research design because every subject gets both treatments. The other typical research design is called a parallel groups design where one group of subjects th does one thing, another group of subjects do another thing. And a, an issue with that design, again, it's, it's great, but there's always different genetics from one group of people to the other. And when you can design a study where the same group of subjects can do both treatments, you, you now can eliminate their genetic composition or their genes from influencing the result. So that's a huge advantage of these within subject studies. So they had, I don't remember exactly how many subjects, let's just say 30 subjects. They divided them into 15. Half of them started with one eating pattern first and the other half started with the other eating pattern first. And the one eating pattern was a very consistent meal scheduling food intake plan. So they ate six meals per day at the same times every day for two weeks, for 14 straight days. The other half of the subjects started with an irregular or a non-consistent meal frequency plan. And that ranged from three meals per day all the way up to, I think it was maybe even 12 to 14 meals per day at all kinds of different times. So some days it was three, some days it was seven, some days it was six, some days 11. So their food intake was all over the board in terms of a schedule and the size of the meals. And that's something else. The, the six meal per day also had the same size of meals. And the other important thing is the, the, the total calories, total protein, carbs, and fat were matched. So the only difference between these two eating approaches was the timing and the, the, the scheduling of these meals. So half the subjects did their thing for 14 days. The other half started with the other feeding strategy for 14 days. Then they had a washout period. I think that was also two weeks. And then they switched. So now when the group started with an irregular feeding pattern, they then switched to the consistent and scheduled uh, meal frequency and vice versa. After each 14-day food trial, the researchers gave a test meal and the test meal was like a standardized breakfast, a few hundred calories. And what the, the main objective of this entire study was they wanted to measure the thermic effect of food. So how many calories are these subjects burning in the hours after eating this test meal? And what they found was the subjects, when they were eating in a consistent and regular feeding frequency, they were able to burn significantly more calories during this test meal than when they were not consistent with their meal intake strategy. Now, statistically significant doesn't always mean practically relevant. So I'm gonna talk, we'll, we'll talk about that. The difference was five calories. So five calories, you can, you can look at that two ways. You can say five calories is nothing or 
as I tried to lay out in, in the issue, there's another way to look at that. I, I'm not saying it's massive, but at least let me present another way to interpret the, 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 the study. So in, to give specific values, over, I think it was a two or three hour period, they burned 23 calories versus 18 calories. That's how much extra yeah. energy the body had to expend to digest, absorb, transport. That's how much more of a thermic effect of food. Now, one other thing, if I just read this study and I had no context, I would think, well, that's interesting, but I'd like to see that replicated. The fact is, this has been replicated. This is just the latest study. There's at least two and possibly three other studies, and I mentioned these in, in the issue, where they found the exact same thing, that a scheduled regular meal frequency allows your body or causes your body to expend more calories. So what do you want? Where do you want to go from here? <laughs> and I yeah. want to get your thoughts too. when at some point during our conversation. Yeah, I thought um, it was like interesting because like you said, it, like, it's significant and people might hear that and think, oh my gosh, like it's going to be like mind blowing, a huge thing. But you have to remember the context of like thermic effect feeding is like 10% anyway so we're already talking about something that's like relatively less significant and i think the increase to totally total daily energy expenditure you guys said was like three percent so it's it's not like it's it's crazy here but i thought it was interesting as well you mentioned uh, i think insulin sensitivity hunger hormones and subjective appetite ratings they were also tested and were lower with the consistent eating pattern so it's not just a win like it's a win on every front for like consistent scheduling and eating uh, so I, I thought that was very interesting. And yeah, the previous studies were, I think there was two others um, that I have noted down here that you took, were also there with like healthy lean women and women uh, with obesity before uh, yes. also were there. And you mentioned that there hasn't been one in resistance trained individuals. I, I don't know if you think that would change the results in any way, shape or form, like someone having been resistance trained. I, I don't think so. I, I'm I'm all I'm of the opinion I'm 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 always going to acknowledge the limitations of, yeah. of a population. So I say it all the time. I'd like to see this in people like me who 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 are exercising. But humans are humans. So my I, I'm always going to acknowledge a different population and a different subset of a human population. But a lot of times we don't have a, a rationale to say that it would be different. Now, clearly, a non-trained person starting resistance training is going to have clearly different adaptations than somebody who's been training 10 years. So there's a situation where you can expect because of prior knowledge. But in things like this, I, I, I wouldn't anticipate a, a bigger or, or I wouldn't anticipate a less of a response. Yeah. And another consideration, as we just talk about the, does this matter? This was one test meal. Assuming that people eat four times per day, if you get, if you were to get the same response, that's now 20 calories per day. And I might add that the test meal calories were not, it was less than 500 calories. So is it, is it possible that a large, at least I believe if my memory serves me correctly, it was less than 500 if you have larger meals, which most people will, does this difference stretch further where there's a greater thermic effect of food? So uh, let me just let me just set the stage for, for the argument of why this five calories in this one test meal matters. And for that, you have to rely on the epidemiological research that says if people can just reduce their caloric intake by about 10 calories per day, they have significantly less fat gain over over the period of a year. Um, and then there's another statement like even five calories per day has massive implications on preventing future obesity. So when you look at just the, the calories on a per day basis, that's where you can create, you, you can at least present an argument that tiny, tiny changes in caloric intake, energy expenditure, it matters over a very over a several year period of time. So again, there's the argument that you would make if you're if you're saying this is this is relevant. And if if you don't take that approach, you would say five calories, I'll just I'll just 
jump out of bed in the morning and get my five calories. Yeah, you know, I, I completely see that argument and it makes sense uh, when you frame it like that as well for people. It's like you need every win you can almost take in some situations. Uh, something I thought, like an interesting thought I had, or at least I thought it was interesting, was whether or not, because these were individuals eating at maintenance, I believe, or like uh, like an estimated maintenance, whether or not eating in a deficit would change anything here if we would still see that increase. And then whether or not, I don't know, I just always think about when you try and do anything to kind of quote unquote trick the body into like trying to expend more energy and like lose more fat, it tends to adapt. And I wonder if in reality, whether or not we'd see these adaptations uh, and we'd still see the practical significance when people are in calorie deficits with it. I don't know if you have any thoughts surrounding that. Yeah, and again, that, that, would, that would be an extrapolation. I, um, we don't know because we don't have that data, but my my position would be i don't have a reason to think that it would be different whether it's a caloric deficit uh because remember these were the same subjects eating the same number of calories um it just happened to be at maintenance um so i wouldn't have any i wouldn't be able to propose a mechanism as to why we would expect anything different in that case yeah um, yeah and i think oh sorry go on no no you you go ahead I was just going to say in terms of um, further thoughts on it, I think it's, it kind of confirms some biases for me as a bodybuilder who like I bang on about to my clients and like for myself, it's like, right, like regular feedings of protein kind of spread through the day to kind of maximize muscle protein synthesis and like give ourselves the best chance of growing muscle. It's like, I think probably a lot of the audience who are like bodybuilders or people very interested or kind of participating in everything but the stage, they're probably already doing quite a bit of this already and it's kind of probably more rare to them to have like a don't know especially going as far as like three to like 12 or whatever meals it might be they probably have quite regular eating kind of behaviors and so it's almost just for me a like reinforcement of like keep kind of doing that where you can because you're probably getting some benefits here from well obviously not so much when you're massing but i don't think it's a case of you want to <laughs> change your eating schedule to get rid of the thermic effect of feeding when you're trying to gain weight i don't know if there's an argument to be said for that but it certainly reinforces especially for dieting to kind of make sure to kind of keep your routine meals coming through yeah that's a that's a really good point and one just from just from a broad perspective this research um is typically the other study was one was in an, um, individuals with obesity, I think females with obesity. So individuals who are not on top of their body composition, they're, they're, they're sedentary. They probably have these large swings. There's just no consistency from day to day. And what you just mentioned makes a lot of sense. It, it already fits our paradigm. If, if you're already trying to maximize the, your muscle mass, well, then you're probably eating protein four to five times per day. And likely you're spreading that out approximately evenly because we, we know that there's this muscle full effect. If you just eat protein constantly or you're trying to eat it every hour, um, you're not really getting a muscle protein synthetic benefit. We also know that if you skip breakfast, uh, we have one study in, from an Italian bodybuilding population skewing protein where essentially protein at breakfast was very small. They were not able to maximize muscle mass gains. So the paradigm you just mentioned, I think it, it, it does. It makes sense for what many of us already do. We eat fairly consistently at consistent times. And we also throw in probably a protein centric approach to that. Yeah. And I think it's, um, I guess, like our the audience for the most part are like that but i guess it's a case of whilst hearing it's significant it's also not a huge thing so if you can't stick to that paradigm like you need the flexibility within your diet to be able to and i know you're a fan of flexible dieting and i guess kind of having a flexible nutrient timing approach would be an element of that potentially it's not yeah. like it's going to wildly throw you off where suddenly like oh no you have to decrease your kind of calorie intake that day because now you've lost that slight edge of thermic effect of feeding uh, I don't imagine like, again, having like one day off, it probably may even not impact the firm effect of feeding like one day. I guess we don't have the study to confirm that, but I doubt it is something that it's like something to to stress about. It's not like another thing to like worry about as uh, what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And as I tried to con just think about the study and, and I'm not like you, I don't, I don't work with clients, but I'm thinking that's how I always approach these things. Like how would I 
interpret this and and where I was at, and I'd love to get your thoughts. If if I'm starting with somebody who's new, they they really don't even know what macronutrients are. This would be so far down the list of important things. Like, let's just get you to appreciate when you're hungry. So, you know, let's just focus on how you eat and how your body responds to that, your feelings of hunger, your feelings of fullness. And I think the, at least in my opinion, the application of this is going to be your serious fitness enthusiast, obviously your competitive bodybuilders who are going to be regimented in many other areas of their life. So asking them to do this is not a big ask, one, and and two, especially at the competitive bodybuilding population that's where you know tiny tiny differences may make big di- may make a big change in their physiques and i think this is probably an area where hey this is now an option for you we have evidence again not in a po- bodybuilding population but this is one of those advanced strategies that's marginal on 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 the on the on the outcomes but it's real statistically significant so i, I that is that is that was kind of my approach to interpreting this for a client population yeah no i i and as a a coach that makes a ton of sense it's kind of like prioritizing things and this is lower in the list when we're thinking about even where like calories macros nutrient timing is kind of something that's lesser important than those two components kind of get those kind of things in check and then potentially come to this as something else but it's completely true like again people might kind of scoff at that the kind of number of calories that it's changing, but for a competitor who's going to stage, like every little bit counts, like people are tracking their steps, maybe they're, like I even did uh, bits of time wearing weighted apparel, I was having uh, standing at my desk for every little bit of like edge I could get. And seemingly this is a way to do something where it doesn't require any extra like work or effort, particularly, you just have to make sure you're eating at similar times. It's like, it's almost a free win in my eyes in that in that scenario where it's like, every little bit of kind of energy expenditure we can get is going to help us towards that goal of stripping off the fat. Yeah. And, and then you also mentioned there are some other benefits, which again, I don't focus on them for, for this research review, but they, they were there. Like there, there were, there were real tangible benefits as well. And it's funny when you say if, if anybody's tracking their step count, and and they're going to say, oh, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> I don't. You're tracking how many steps you take. You take thousands of steps a day, and you're counting each one. Now, granted, you're using technology to do that, but it's probably the same type of person that's going to perceive value from this. Uh, um, would would be my estimation. Yeah. A question I had, I I didn't read the study directly, so I don't know if it said it in there. I, I just read your kind of overview of it. In terms of the, like the regularity of meals kind of said to eat at the same time, is that like literally they were given the meal at 3 p.m., like 6 p.m., 9 p.m., and they had to, like they sat down and ate? Or do you think there's like a, a window here where like eat between like a 4 and 4.30? I don't know if that was uh, even said in the study itself. Yeah, I, I don't recall because um, I, I mean, even if I, I'm never good at remembering the details, even in my own research studies. But I do believe it was a very consistent, like, hey, be, within these 30 minutes, have this meal within these 30 minutes. And that was for the entire two week period. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I'm just like, how, how regular is kind of regular. Uh, and I guess it's just aiming for as regular as possible. And don't like, again, like I said, if you're slightly irregular, it's not like it's a night and day difference. Kind of don't stress on that. Just know that, oh, it's probably another thumbs up for you having your regular scheduled meals. And it's like you mentioned, you didn't really focus on like the um, satiety benefits and things like that. But I think that even in for itself could be a big win for, again, for someone who's gem pop. Maybe they're not even tracking their nutrition, but if they just start eating at the same times, they burn this little bit extra calories and they get better satiety. Maybe they end up just eating less totally. So um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting study. I'd be interested to see more. Is there anything from this you're like, I would design like a study this way, or is there anything more from this you want to see? Yeah, I, I think that the natural extension would be to to do this over three months or four months and then see, are these little changes manifesting as actual body fat losses? Now that's a very big ask of a researcher to, to plan that. 
um, for that for that long of a period of time. But that's really the the main question: is does five calories per meal, or maybe a little bit more if the meals are larger? Again, over three, four, maybe five meals per day, does that actually manifest as actual body fat losses? Um, here's something too that that kind of that I would relay to this, which is taken from another body of research. Uh, I, I hear a lot of people say, in terms of caffeine supplementation, you get a little bit of a bump in your in in the energy expenditure, your your post consumption energy expenditure. And it's not a lot of calories. Again, we're talking probably seven to 15 calories over an hour or two period. Uh, my lab just finished a, a study looking at this. And I often hear that, well, that's not enough to actually cause losses in body fat. And I, I actually have, and I have not published this yet, but I did the study and it was a training study. And it did. We gave our subjects caffeine. Um, once per day for the first four weeks, then we doubled the dosage to twice per day. Um, they just maintained their diets and they resistance trained and they actually lost significantly more body fat just from, from a caffeine containing uh, thermogenic supplement. I, I'm one to believe the only thing that's really doing anything is the caffeine in most of those supplements. But at least from the the, the data that I have from my lab, um, and we actually did the, we actually did a, a a a previous study on that same supplement, which we did publish. It was the thermic effect from the from that supplement, where it bumped calories, you know, eight, ten, twelve calories for, per hour for a couple hours. Then we took it and put it in actual resistance trained males over eight weeks. So to me, that that just reinforces these little bumps in energy expenditure. While they're not seemingly large, that there's a case where it did. Now that wasn't meal timing. That wasn't um, regular feedings. That was a caffeine containing supplement, but it did reinforce that anything that bumps your metabolic rate up every day consistently for weeks and weeks and weeks can and potentially will cause losses of, of actual fat mass tissue. Yeah, that that's really interesting. I guess, uh, the, again, as a, a bodybuilder and competing, you might use a number of these and combine them. And then it's really starting to look like a significant amount of calories that you're uh, enabling yourself to burn, I guess for, and again, it, I understand kind of the arguments, like you said, like people say, no, it's not enough to make a difference. They might argue, again, if you're a flexible dieter, maybe you, you eat a varied diet and like some of these nutritional labels could be off by 20% because they're allowed that kind of variance. And now that's nullified anything extra you're burning, but it's like, yeah, but it's still extra calories you're burning. It's still helping you move. It's moving the needle in the right direction for, again, like a caffeine supplement. You know, I mean, there could be downsides to sleep or like monetary, but it, like as long as you're kind of still getting good sleep and you can afford it, it's another like easy win per se, I think. Yes, yeah. And especially, again, if you're not adverse to the effort of just scheduling your meals. And in fact, I'll bet you most people would say, you're, you're, it's not extra effort. It's more effort to not do this because now you're, you know, you're, you're scrambling. When am I going to eat? Now I'm heart hungry. And it's, it's just part of that planning or regimented lifestyle that, that is appealing to a lot of us. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and I actually, I didn't plan to, uh, we, we, uh, have covered that study really succinctly and I didn't plan to, to cover the other one that you reviewed in your January edition, but are you happy to talk about that one as well? Yeah, yeah, I would love to. Just because we've got some I actually, time. I really like that one. So this was, does changing it, well, the kind of your title for it, does changing up your resistance training program frequently lead to better gains uh, in muscle hypertrophy? And that was uh, like the, the review, the, the people that studied it, sorry, were Angelari uh, 2022. I'll make sure I've kind of got the studies linked below. So if people want to check those out, obviously check out your kind of review as well so they can check things over there. But um, I think, again, this is one of those ones where, I think if I'm thinking as the listener kind of seeing this and at least my thoughts were, I was like, depends how the, how frequently is frequently. And then also um, generally I'm like, stay with something for a long period of time. And like, you see those adaptations. So I'm actually interested in, I, I didn't look too closely at this one as the, per the other one, but I'd be very interested to know kind of how that went. Yeah. So the, the context here is how often should you change up your pro, your resistance training program? And I want to I want to delineate something. 
I don't think this is my personal opinion. If you're constantly changing up your big program, I'm going to, I'm going to have this coach write me a program. And then after three weeks, I don't like it. I'm going to switch to this coach and they're going to write me a program. I, I think that's, that is not good. That is not ideal where you're constantly changing up the actual programs because each coach has a training program philosophy that they are using in their system that will probably manifest positive adaptations over several months. So I would, I would take the position you stay with a program for extended periods of time. So that's my base position. And, and that is my opinion. Now, within this program, how often should you change up the variables in that program? That's what this study asked. So it was the same exercises. So we're not talking about different exercises. And I think I could make an argument to change up exercises or to keep consistent exercises in. But what they did, they what, what the question was, if we change the, the variables of our program, from workout to workout, is that going to cause a significant increase in muscle hypertrophy? Or does this constant changing actually suppress or inhibit our hypertrophic response? So let me explain what they did on the consistent program first. So these were resistance trained males. They had them do a lower body resistance training program consisted of two exercises leg press and leg extension. They did the workout two days per week. And in the consistent program, they had them choose a weight that allowed them to do nine to 12 repetitions maximum. There was two minutes of rest between each set. There was a normal cadence. So there wasn't an emphasis on the concentric or the eccentric exercise. And they did eight total sets, four sets of the leg press, four sets of the leg extension. So what I just described, I think is a very typical program. And it actually looks like a lot of my programming, um, other than I, I take a lot more than two minutes. I, that would just yeah. be painful to me. <laughs> it seems that a lot of other researchers, they use a very short <laughs> yeah. period, um, that I would never do in my own workouts. So the other, the other arm of this study, and I, I'll say this now, this was what we would also call a within, I don't know if you call it a within limb study. So the researchers took resistance trained males. And since they had two legs, they had one leg that they randomized to what I just said. They did the same workouts, nine to 12 reps, two minutes rest periods, a normal eccentric and concentric rep, and a normal, um, normal set volume of eight sets per workout. And then they randomized the other leg to the, let's just call it the changing workout. So at every single workout, they changed one of those variables. So as an example, one workout, instead of doing eight sets, they did 12 sets. So six sets of leg press, six sets of leg extension. In another workout, the repetition range, instead of nine to 12 reps, they did 25 to 30 repetitions. Um, and then in the third and going to the next workout, they changed the the um, the muscle action. So it was eccentric actions only. So they would put um, a I think it was one hundred and ten percent of their normal nine to twelve load, and they had them do ten eccentric only concentrations. So that's just where if you're on a leg press, you're just letting the the weight come down towards your torso very slowly. And then the researchers were lifting it up for you and you would lower it again. And then lastly, they also had the subjects increase their rest periods in another workouts from instead of two minutes, it was four minutes. So, at, and again, in this changing program, every single workout, something was being changed as compared to the other leg where there was never a change. It was the same thing, workout after workout after workout. And the way that they measured muscle hypertrophy in this study was by muscle biopsy. So they, they were able to assess the muscle cross-sectional area of individual muscle fibers. So they took type one and type two muscle fibers and, and looked at how much did they grow in their area. So at the end of the study, 
what they reported was it did not matter if you did the same workout every single day for eight weeks, or if you decided to ch change up these variables, if you did constant changing of the different variables, you also got nearly the identical amount of muscle hypertrophy. And it was about, a, I think it was near a little over 12% muscle cross-sectional area growth from the muscle biopsy extracts that they investigated. So there's the, that was the study. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about it. It's, it's, it's um, a lot of what they did mimics what I do. And, and I speak out of both sides of my mouth. I'm always telling people, don't change it up so much. <laughs> At the same time, I change up my workouts, uh, not the exercises, but a lot of these variables I do. So. Oh, really? What, Interesting. Yeah. Um, I'd be curious, what, what was your initial thought when, when you saw that? Do you not see the progress you would like? Are you sick of writing your own programs? Or perhaps you need some accountability in order to stick with the plan? Then it's time to start working with us. We at Revive Stronger offer a truly personalized coaching service. You'll get more than just an email with some macros or random cookie cutter program. With Revive Stronger, you will be the center of our attention. You will receive your own fully individualized training protocol alongside a customized nutritional strategy. We created the coaching around your needs, wants, personal preferences, and your own unique lifestyle. Every single week, we delve into your program in order to make appropriate adjustments so that we get the most out of your time and the best possible outcome. We help both female and male athletes to seriously change their body composition by adding more muscle mass and decreasing fat tissue. No matter if you're a competitive bodybuilder or just want to look better, if you need help with your progress and taking your physique to the next level, our coaching is for you. It's time to make a change. Sign up today and let's revive stronger. Yeah, so uh, it was interesting hearing about how it was changed. And like, again, they actually threw in tons of different ways of doing things, obviously the same exercises, but like changing the eccentrics, like changing even the set volume. And it, the immediate kind of thought that came to mind uh, was because I had a conversation with someone in the gym recently, and he was trying to encourage me to do a, a program with him with, uh, I think it was like assisted force reps or something. And I, he was like saying, you've got to shock the body. Like, <laughs> this is going to be really good for you. And I'm like, oh, I don't come from the perspective that shocking the body is a pretty like a smart idea and uh, that's what it made me think of here where suddenly i don't know doubling this the set volume or something that could lead to like a lot of um, like soreness and damage so you can't then hit your next session as recovered as you should be and kind of i like a more systematic approach where week on week you're trying to kind of progressively overload and kind of keep hold of variables and track progress and logbook that Whereas when you're changing them so frequently, I'm like, oh, that kind of draws a bit of anxiety in me. Like, how, how do you know you're progressing? But I guess if you do it long enough for random enough and you're logbooking it, you could look back and see like, have I done this? It also brings me to an, like something that you hear all the times, like there's many roads to Rome. As long as you're hitting kind of intensity thresholds, relative intensity thresholds, which they work, so they trained, I guess, to, to failure. Yes, and then and I, they, I didn't mention that, but I'm glad you mentioned that. So yeah, yes. intensity was controlled. So then they're, they're doing that and then they're clearly doing enough volume over time. And then I guess they were, if they're training to failure, they're always looking to, I'm guessing loads and reps might have gone up over time as they were adapting to it. Then it's like, well, if you're meeting the principles kind of, and they're like the most basic ones for hypertrophy, like there's many roads to Rome and maybe you can vary things up a little bit more, even though I guess as an advanced bodybuilder, I feel like that. I think in some ways, again, you could argue varying it more for an advanced bodybuilder because they can handle it and maybe a bit more of that novelty will help them. Uh, but at the same time, I'm like, gains come so slowly. Like I'd be like great to see 12% additional kind of quad growth over eight weeks. Um, like it's hard to track. And so like strength progressions are one of our best tools. So not varying things too quickly is kind of a, a useful thing in that regard. So yeah, a lot of thoughts. <laughs> yeah, and I find myself having to defend not changing up a workout just when I talk to students or or especially beginner trainers, like you said, you have to change it up. You have to do this. And I'm like, I, I don't think that's true. And this study clearly reported that they did nothing different for eight straight weeks and got just as much growth as, again, if you want to be sensational, shocking the muscle, yeah. um, confusing the muscle, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and I feel like I'm in the minority, and I'll say this, and you have a better perspective of what the world is doing in the in the real world of programming. But I, 
I, I feel like you could do the same workout for a long time and your body will adapt and your body will grow and you don't have to change much. Now, even though I believe that, I change up my workouts to the extent that I like um, some of my rep ranges. I like to be lower with heavier weights, um, particularly like my, I guess you'd call them the, the powerlifting exercises. Um, I like my single joint exercises. Generally, I like to go higher reps with lighter weights. Um, and I like to change my exercise rotations within a program. But if I'm going to be honest, I've been, and I'm getting to be an old guy, I'm doing the same exercises I've done my entire life, but I do rotate them. So this is where I, I talk out of both sides of my mouth. I don't think you have to change up your workouts at all, but I do just because I think it keeps it fresh for me. It's more of a, I'm more, a little more excited going to the gym if I'm not doing just leg extensions again. Like I can do, you know, Bulgarian split squats, um, front squats or something to that effect. So th that's kind of my general interpretation. And I, I almost sound like a politician because I'm making, I'm either angering everybody <laughs> or making everybody happy. Yeah, I would say for the listener, um, they're probably more kind of similar to where I'm coming from. And like, I would say as the general evidence-based kind of practitioner, they are more so keeping like a, a mesocycle of worth of training, like a I don't know four to eight week period, say, and everything's fairly stable within that. There's not too many kind of variables changing. You might have uh, kind of undulations within the week, like different rep ranges. And maybe some people change exercises even week to week, but within like the construct of the mesocycle is pretty yes. static and you're looking to progress things up until a point you, you kind of need a deload to recover. And then maybe assess kind of how progress has been, what movements are feeling good, if anything's feeling a bit stale or it's like causing a niggle somewhere and just rotating exercises, more of a case of, okay, this one is causing me issues now. It's not feeling as good. It's maybe not progressing too well, but trying to keep it in there as well, as long as it's progressing and feeling good, it's almost like keep it in there for as long as possible because why would you change it if, it if your body's adapting to it well? So I think that's the perspective of the audience here at least. But in general, in the in the real world, um, I think it's way more like let's let's do something different this day. Like, oh, I'm feeling this exercise. Let's go to this one, this one, this one. And um, I guess if people were training to true failure, at least of how this study would explain it, they could still see. And I think some people do see progress well that way. And uh, I think a lot of people don't truly test themselves, and that's where they get in trouble because they're like, oh, that felt hard. And they're just relearning exercises and they're not actually ever causing their body a stress to adapt to. Yes. And that's that's one point that one of my expert contributors made, her Lexa Ruxtella. Um, she made the argument, if you're constantly changing up your exercises, there's a period of adaptation that you go through every time you bring in a different exercise. And I know that. I, I, I lived that when I started New Mesocycle. Um, I can get a number of more repetitions the second week or the second time through that movement. And I guess that's just neuromuscular efficiency. And then one other thing, when I, when I commented that I changed my exercises, that's all planned out. Like I have typically like you, I, I usually do four week training blocks. Um, and what I do is I have a rotation. Okay. So let's just say um, I'm going to use three different over these four weeks. I'm going to have three different exercises for my biceps or five different exercises for my shoulders. And it's probably not much different than what you're, than what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, my philosophy tends to be for that reason of that kind of neuromuscular efficiency, certainly compound lifts, the more complex lifts, they're not ones you want to vary as often for like bicep curls or something i'm not so like worried if someone changes that after yep. two weeks to something else because i'm like how much learning is there involved going from a preacher curl to like a like a standing dumbbell curl or wh whatever it might be i guess my other concern would be with the more ad hoc change of things is that kind of the shock factor and how that could be negative in that it takes people past like an adaptive threshold where now they're sore and they can't train well for the next session. Whereas when you keep variables relatively static, like you are with your programming, you know, you're recovering from something and you know, you're adapting to it. Whereas if you suddenly were like, ah, I just feel like I feel good today. I'm going to double my volume. And then you're like, okay, that screwed me for my next session. That's no longer going to go well, or I have to deload early or something. Yes. Hey, one thing I've done in the last two months, 
I have my set training volume for 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 it, every muscle group. Um, and it's it would be relatively low volume for most people, but it's what I can hit each week. And I'm really liking this. I have a three day per week plan, a four day per week plan, and a five day per week plan. But it's all the same volume, and it just allows me if I have a week where I'm just I'm too busy. Well, there I'm just going to turn that into a three or four day per week because I'm going to get all my volume. And I've never done that. I've always just had. I, I guess at times maybe I've had a rotation three, four, three, four, four, five, but literally each week, as long as I, you know, if I can get five, it's great. But if I only get three, I'm still getting the same set volume on all of my major body parts. And I'm, I'm really liking this approach again, never done it in the history of, of my training career, but it's, um, it, it's something that I really like. And I, the flexibility definitely appeals to me. And I think that's, when you can, when it's an amount of volume that you could do productively in three days, that's where like there's so much flexibility there because then you can go three to five. But say if someone, I don't know, they've got a set amount of volume, it's like if you did that, they've, they've got like a six day per week plan and they're like, now I have to try and constrain this to like four days. That's when normally quality of like volume goes down and things like this. And that's where maybe a higher volume program is less appropriate. So someone for you, like that, that makes a ton of sense that yeah, on days where, or I wonder if you felt the difference when you have five days, you spread that volume out. Theoretically, you're fresher for every kind of movement or at least subsequent movement within that session. Are you able to perform better versus when you have to constrain it to three? Yeah, I, I mean... When I was designing these, I was thinking, oh, good, I can be in and out in 30 to 35 minutes when I do my five day per week because yeah. I, I look at everything through time. But the, even it's it's funny. It's still taking me about 40 minutes on the when I do it five days per week. And um, that includes about a five minute dynamic warm up. And my three days per week are right around an hour. So it's 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 not as big as what I was hoping for. Um but like I said, if I have an inordinate amount of meetings early in the week, no stress, I, I've all planned out. Like I, I can just um, nail it. I, I wanted to also, I don't know if we have time. Um, I wanted to change the the topic for, sure. for a moment. Um, I'm, I, I was going to just get your opinion on a case study that I'm going to do on myself. Um, do we have time for that? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so... The, this is something my research team and I have been developing for, for a few months. And this stems from, this is a nutrition study um, that I'm going to conduct on myself. So I'm going to make this at a scientific level. The, the, the creation of this stems from the general dieting culture. So looking at the questions that I get on my social media, because my, my audience is people who are they love exercise, they like nutrition, but I also seem to get a lot of new people that have a lot of basic questions. So the people that are very um, confused about just dieting and exercise. And I feel, in my opinion, there's a lot of people who when they, when they wanna go on a diet for, for the, a good reason of wanting, wanting or needing to lose body fat, they feel or they've been told or they even worse, they believe I have to reduce my carbs. Like if I'm dieting, it has to be low carb. And in, at least in my perspective, it is not going away. It's not gotten better. So something that I'm going to do, and I'll, I'll start this probably in the next two to three weeks, I'm putting myself on an extended diet that will be very high carbohydrates. Um, and I'm going to go out of my way to get as many highly insulinogenic foods that I know, according to the research, that will elevate insulin. So your, you know, your high sugar, um, highly processed foods. Um, and I'm going to chronicle this again. This will be set up as a scientific experiment. I I plan to register the trial um, on one of those um, listservs where you can, you know, put in your methodology. I'll send it to you just for you oh, to awesome. look at. I'm still still writing the introduction. Um, but essentially I'm testing, can you lose body fat when you eat a, not just a high carbohydrate diet, but a insulinogenic diet? Because that's, again, that's the goal here. And I'm hoping, and again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I won't lose body fat, although... <laughs> <laughs> 
it would contradict every other st- every study I've ever read on, yeah. on, on body fat loss. <laughs> but I'm hoping that this could be the study that that other people could say, hey, look, this guy told us before he started this exactly what he was going to do. Here's every single piece of food he ate during the during these six months or five months, whatever. Um, and here's what happened. And I'm going to get blood work. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have my resistance training public so everybody knows. Um, my, here's my question for you. Do you think that's still, is it just me? Or do you think a lot of people are still confused with the whole carbs and dieting paradigm? I think in like gen, like in the more general population outside of like our more, again, evidence-based fit, absolutely. Because you get people, I don't know, like I've forgotten his name, Liver King and people like this who are coming out and becoming very popular and kind of having carnivore diets, keto diets and like carbohydrates still get a bad rap. And again, people rely on these kind of insulin, like hypotheses surround, like they focus on this mechanistic kind of thing that's going on. It's like, oh, now you can't burn fat. And it's like, oh, look at the bigger picture type of thing. Like, and like you mentioned all these, these research papers. And I think what will be really great is because people know you already and they know you as someone who's like rigorous with scientific like research and everything like this. So seeing you go through it personally and seeing the results, it will feel closer to a lot of people because you've got kind of a, a really good social media following. So I think that'll be quite powerful. Whereas if it was a, some, some like any other Joe, Sally or what have you, they'd be like, oh, but like it's them but because it's going to be you and you already kind of have that following and people know kind of like and trust you in that sense. I think this will be really cool again assuming it goes how we we almost know it's gonna go (laughs) yeah um but i'm prepared if it doesn't i'm prepared to at least in my mind on this body i I could change my opinion uh uh, i I don't think that's gonna happen but and that's the reason i want to i want to make the methods public i want to invite anybody who would say well this is a horrible design you're biasing this towards I'm like, no, the only thing I'm doing is I'm eating in a caloric deficit on a very highly carbohydrate, highly insulinogenic diet. I don't I don't know how I could bias it, but again, it's out there. I, I want to put it out there, but I also want to start this soon. So I got <laughs> yeah. I gotta get moving on on several fronts. I keep delaying it because I keep wanting <laughs> to read more about the carbohydrate insulin model and oh I see. Yeah. 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 But I've been for for months. I've adjusted my eating to prepare me for this. So my okay. protein intake has been as low as it's been in my adult life because what I want, the only, I don't want it to be, um, not only am I reducing my calories, but I'm also lowering my protein. Um, so I've been eating this type of diet, but just maintaining my weight. So literally the only difference will be a caloric deficit. My my protein intake has been, I mean, it's been low at 1.2 grams per kg right around there, okay. which is low for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask is you mentioned it was a high carb diet. And I was wondering if you were still going for like, again, the like two grams per kilo type of like no, uh, protein. Can't, or- can't do it. If, if you're, if I'm serious about trying to make it high carb, you, you couldn't do it. Um, I, I think our target is at least 60% carbs. And as you okay. get closer to 70%, especially when I'm going to be in a deficit, it, it gets very hard to get enough fat. And um, again, I'm willing to go low protein. And, and I think uh, my training, again, I've been, I'm, I'm keeping my set volume the same. It's been the same. So literally the only difference will be the caloric deficit. But yeah, I'm, I'm definitely sacrificing <laughs> my, my comfort level with protein. Yeah. And I have, yeah, I have been for months. Will you be able to have much fiber with that as well? Or do you have to set like, is it going to be a painful diet in terms of satiety for that reason as well? Like you can't have too much fruit and veg. No, well, what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to have a vegetable soup uh, that I make homemade okay. every day. So that's like 60 calories. So I'll have that every day. I, I want to get some vegetable intake. Um, and a lot of this will be fruit. Uh, uh, a fair portion will be fruit based, um, fruit smoothie based. Um, one, it's hundred percent, you know, nearly a hundred percent carbs. Um, two, I might as well tackle the fructose demon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> while, while we're at it. Um, I didn't even think about that before. Um, 
But yeah, fiber probably won't be high as I look at the types of foods and I'm going to eat a lot of white rice. I'm eating a lot of bagels, um, processed cereals, chocolate chip cookies. (laughs) Um, But again, then I'm also getting my vegetable soup and and, and these fruit smoothies. Um, Yeah. So yeah, it's, I'm I'm very much looking forward to it. I'm I'm as heavy as I've ever been. So I'm, I I need, I, I, I want to. I'm motivated yeah. to go on the diet. Yeah. This would be a good, like you said, for the fructose, for insulin, for carbs, but also maybe even another thumbs up for like flexible dieting and hitting your macros and micros. And you can do that with a, a wide range of different sources. So yeah, the, at least for you as a N equals one, but um, yeah, that'll be uh, really interesting to see you go ahead with that and documenting it. And I'm sure I'll have to drag you back on to talk about that. Um, but I did before you go, I uh, want to talk about, I know you and Lane have just kicked off a kind of uh, physique education course. I think I've named it wrong, but I think, like I said off air, the audience listening are exactly the type of people that be interested in this sort of thing. So I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Yeah. So we just, we just made public a uh, physique coaching Academy. So it's Dr. Lane Norton, myself, and we've partnered with clean health fitness Institute. That's a company out of Australia. And this is a course to help prepare coaches and fitness professionals that really focus on fat loss and weight loss in their clientele. So in it, it's obviously some of it's geared towards bodybuilding. It's, it's very bodybuilding focused, but it's not intended to only be contest prep. It's also for people who work with clients that want to lose body fat. So extremely evidence-based, uh, we're, we're launching this as kind of a mentorship model where we're going to have um, weekly weekly webinars. So Lane and myself and the Clean Health team, every week, one of us, whether it be myself, Lane, or or the Clean Health Fitness Institute team, will get on with our students and answer questions, talk about maybe some of the latest research that's come out, kind of like we just did here just talking about that kind of stuff, answering questions, client questions. So it's 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 kind of pioneering in the sense, yes, it's coursework. It's an eight module. It's an eight month course. Uh, Lane and I have been working for over, I, I think it's been over two years on the content. And it's it's a it's a big investment into somebody's career who wants to help people with fat loss and and re, and get the evidence based approaches from this. And I want to thank you for, for bringing it up and for asking me about it. Oh yeah, for sure. It's uh, again, like I said, I think the the audience here are definitely interested in that. And is that something that's already has it already launched? I've seen it advertised a little bit. I think by Lane and maybe yourself, but I don't know if it's has already. By the time this comes out, which will be end of end of February, has it already live. Can people are their cohorts? Can people sign up whenever they like? Yeah. So we've 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 opened it for signups, and then the plan is to to launch it in May. So, okay. and, and I would add to that, we, we were offering 50% off to anybody who registers before, either before May or until we have 250 people in the course. Okay. Uh, and, and as, as we kind of were talking through this, that's the lowest cost that it will ever be. It, it, it will never, cause we want to generate a lot, um, an early interest in, in the course. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. And I think those kind of weekly calls will be super valuable as well, where you get kind of one-on-one contact with you guys. So yes. uh, yeah, they're very exciting. I'm, I'm excited to see how that runs for you guys and excited for more uh, reviews. Uh, in terms of for the review, if people are interested in that, um, what's the next one you've got? What are some of the ones that are being looked at Ooh, just to tease? Yeah. So when, when you make this live, I'll have the February issue out. So I, I release each issue of Body by Science on the, the middle of each month. And the the issue coming out for February is that the article that I'm very excited about is water intake and its impact on fat loss. So I've always heard, hey, you should drink water. It increases your metabolism or it blunts your hunger. I've, I've I found the best review study I've ever found. They've It was very comprehensive. So after reading that, um, you will have a definitive coaching plan on water intake for the purposes of fat loss. Now, I want to say something in, in, in respect to your audience. 
your audience and your clients, you're, they're already drinking a lot of water. Um, it's probably just part of their of the, just their normal routine. Th- I don't think I'm going to add anything, any other benefit than what they're currently doing. But water preloads, like drinking 500 mils before meals. I, there's two studies that looked at that and looked at long-term body fat loss. Um, we also talked about just in general, how much water should you take per day? So I went into that thinking, I know a lot about water. I now, I now have a definitive water intake plan that's backed by the evidence. So I'm, I'm awesome. Yeah. It's, water's boring. Yeah. But, oh, <laughs> this, this is cool. And again, I kind of kicked myself. I'm like, I'm a physique scientist. Like I'm a fat loss scientist and I never really had a, a command of water on that process. I had thoughts, I've read a study here and there, but now I feel very confident, like this is the plan that I would put somebody on. That's awesome. I think that, I mean, that sounds exciting to me. I know you said water's boring, but you've sold it to me. I'm very excited to hear about it because similarly, (laughs) it's not something you see like a much said on. It's like, oh, don't be dehydrated, have clear peas through the day. Of course, like there can be strategies with the, the kind of before meals, kind of loading up on kind of having that drink, but nothing, kind of to the extent that you're talking about. So very excited for that. So I'll make sure that's linked in the bio as well, uh, okay. along with everything else with your Instagram. So that's all there. So I, I just want to say a massive thank you again, Bill, for coming on. It's been a fun chat as always, and I'm sure there'll be another one in the future. Uh, and I guess we'll talk to you soon. Yes. Looking forward to it. Cheers, guys. Losing weight fast while maintaining muscle mass. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? It isn't though, it's reality and we know how to do it and we will help you achieve this. The Mini Cup Movement is an eight week fat loss program to make you lose a huge chunk of fat while maintaining muscle mass at the same time. We will support you from the beginning to the end so that you see the results you would like to and come out of it much stronger. You will receive a fully automated spreadsheet that is based on your nutritional needs. You can choose between six different male and female training templates. Over 30 videos will guide you through each and every single step of the mini cut so that you're getting the most out of your journey and that you always know what to do. But the best thing is that you can start whenever you want. The mini cut movement is open 24 seven. So if you want to learn more or you're ready to sign up, hit the link in the description below. So let's revive stronger together.